things I wanted to ask you about was the difference between Nazism and Bolshevism, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I read a lot of books on World War II, and we have this we have this tendency in the United States. I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I'm probably I could be wrong, uh, but uh, that Nazis are to the right and Bolsheviks are to the left, right? And in and, and a lot of ways, the Nazis, Hitler himself, saw it that way, right? He was yeah. the fight against Bolshevism, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but a lot of the, their tendencies are very similar, right? So um, their political actions are, the, are very similar. What, what is that distinction between Nazism and Bolshevism? Um, that's another great question. And it's, that's a highly, 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 highly contested uh, zone among historians and actually to some extent out in our culture. I, I've noticed in recent years, um, the American right, like people like Dinesh D'Souza have really picked up the idea the Nazism is actually on the left because then they can use that as a brush to tar, you know, AOC, right? You can say, well, AOC is a Nazi, just like Hitler, and it's all on the left, which is about 90% nonsense with a little nugget of truth in there somewhere. Um, um, so, yeah, let, let's take the Nazis first. So, you know, Hitler's party, we sometimes forget this, but the full name of his party was the National Socialist German Workers' Party. So if you took the national off that, if you had something called um, the Socialist German Workers' Party, you would have to assume this is a party of the left, probably the Marxist left. Um, you add the national on there and it gets complicated because in traditional political theory, nationalism and socialism are supposed to be opposite uh, and irreconcilable. And the Nazi project, like the fascist project in general, was very much about actually finding a, a uniting element between the left and the right in the sense, in the, well, I should say between socialism and, and nationalism in the sense that they were looking for a more inclusive and egalitarian politics that would still be nationalist at a time when socialists were expressly internationalist and you know uh, denied in a sense the legitimacy of nationalism. So this is, kind of the innovation of Mussolini and Hitler, like looking for this egalitarian but nationalist politics. Um, where does that sit right and left? I mean, the answer to that is it's a moving target. If you look at both Mussolini's fascism and, and Hitler's Nazism in their earlier years, you can see more elements that are quite identifiably left. But the thing is, as they got power and as they consolidated power, the process really was to exclude the left elements and focus on the right elements. So, you know, it, for Hitler, the classic uh, example of this is how he got along with his brown shirts, the stormtroopers, which were actually, this sounds weird, but the, the stormtroopers were sort of the hotbed of what we call left-wing Nazism, more kind of egalitarian, anti-elite, anti-capitalist Nazism. It, if it lived anywhere, it lived in the stormtroopers, weirdly enough. Um, and, you know, when the Nazis come to power, Hitler basically crushes them. And when he does that, he's kind of crushing the left element in Nazi ideology. And then if you look at, again, in practice, if you look at what the Nazis did, who did Hitler persecute? Well, right off the bat, he wasn't really persecuting Jews much in the early phase. Who he was really going after was communists and social democrats. If you look at, if you want to know who's in a concentration camp in the first few years the Nazis are in power, the answer is communists and social democrats, basically. He's, he's going after the left. So Nazism becomes much more clearly and unambiguously a, a movement and a regime of the right. Now, Bolshevism, it, it almost, I think, has the opposite trajectory uh, because, you know, Russian Bolshevism clearly starts as a movement of the left, no question about that. Um, in power, especially under Stalin, uh, in some ways, it starts to move to a much more nationalist model. And, you know, the historian who I think has really made this point effectively is Timothy Snyder, uh, especially in his book, Bloodlands. You know, he's got a, a line in there, which, uh, which I've quoted to in my stuff, where it's at one point during the terror in the late 30s, when Stalin's uh, secret police is uh, rounding up uh, 
people from various ethnic groups and basically slaughtering them, especially uh, ethnic Poles who are Soviet citizens. And Stalin writes to a secret police chief and says something like, good, keep rounding up and exterminating this Polish filth, which sounds like something that could have come out of the mouth of Hitler. And what it speaks to is, you know, Stalin's regime in power starts to look pretty much like Hitler's regime in the sense that it's, it's targeting people on the basis of nationality or like national identification or origins uh, in a highly brutal way. So, you know, I think for both regimes, in some ways, the ideological roots become less important as they become dictatorships and as dictatorships, they sort of do dictatorship things, um, unrestrainedly violent for the most part, dictatorship things. <laughs>